Good morning, everybody. My name is Wendy Catton. I am the parent director of a group called Raise Your Hand. We're a citywide uh, parent coalition advocating for uh, improved public education for all students. Um, the reason we're here today is because um, CPS currently has roughly 6,000 children um, in special education on their current closing list. Um, they have 39 schools with special education cluster programs on this list. That's where children with uh, more profound and severe disabilities like autism and other conditions are being bused in, especially to receive services um, that they don't get and they haven't been able to get at their neighborhood school. We're here because Chicago Public Schools has admitted that they did not take the, the classroom size rates of kids in special ed into their utilization formula. Todd Babbitts, who is at the cabinet level and involved in this process, admitted this at a Chicago Education Facilities Task Force meeting three weeks ago. Yet nothing has happened since then. Chicago Public Schools has traumatized these families. Many of these schools are full. I have been in them. Due to ha having eight to 15 children in their rooms, they are not underutilized and they're likely going to be on this closing list tomorrow or the next day when it's released. We cannot believe that this district has shown such callous disregard for the lives of children, our most vulnerable children in this district. Additions are being put up in the mayor's ward for schools that are not even underutilized. Yet these children are going to be sent packing to who knows where with no plan in sight for how their children who need routine and consistency, how they're going to have a proper education. I personally have seen CPS botch 504 plans for my own child. I know that they cannot properly transition 6,000 children with IEPs in one school year. This is a, a disgrace that they didn't come into these buildings and assess them properly. There's no way that they can do transition plans when they couldn't even assess these buildings properly and show these parents and children the respect they deserve. We're going to hear from parents today from, I think we have 13 schools here that are on this list and let you hear from their perspective how they think this will impact their children. Uh, first we're going to have from Smith School, Lashara Wilson. I too have a, five, a 10 year old son who is in fifth grade and he has autism. He was diagnosed with autism when he was 11 months old. I'm begging public school system not to close Smith or any school that had, where parents have children that have special needs. It's already hard enough to find schools for our children. Where are we supposed to go? I live in a district where, because of where I live, the next closest school that has an autism program, I'm not in the zone for, and the school is only eight minutes away from my home where I live. So where am I to take my son? You can't transition autistic children. They don't take well to change. So changing them is going to create behavioral problems in the classroom and at home. It's going to make learning hard. What's going to happen to all of the specialists that are needed? You need social workers to yes. take care of the parents. You Then you need the teacher aides in the classroom yes. to assist the teachers. What's going to happen when teachers are so overworked and tired that they can't tend to children anymore? Yes. This is not something that should be taken lightly. Just because a child has a disability or they're different, that does not mean that they don't don't deserve the opportunity to become a productive citizen yes. like you and I. Yes. Who knows? One of our children here today could be the next Barack Obama, the yes. next yes. Michelle Obama. Yes. Give these children yes. a chance. Yes. How can you do something like yes. this? You're hurting the parents and you're hurting the children. Have a heart. Be considerate. Yes. You went to school to be a teacher. Yes. Show that you love the children. Show that you love the parents. Yes. Have some type of compassion. Mm -hmm. Keep understand that these children are already hurting they're already functioning in their okay. own world so a lot of them only have parents and their teachers yes. to deal with on an everyday basis don't close our schools it doesn't matter what race creed or color yes. a child is yes. they deserve an opportunity oh, yes. for proper education thank you okay we're gonna have um, Lozano School, uh, Tammy Novak and Henry Morales next. Yes. 
My daughter, Julia Novak, is a proud sixth grader at Lozano Elementary School. This is our first year at Lozano after attending three different Chicago public schools over the last three years. Julia is diagnosed with a physical disability, speech and language delays, cognitive, cognitive delays, and an IQ that dropped from 79 to 51. She is academically functioning around a second grade level and has been for the past two years. Last year, at another Chicago public school, she was suspended nine different times. This was the solution they offered to manage the anxiety she displayed from clearly being overwhelmed by a curriculum that was not meeting her academic needs. Suspending my cognitively delayed daughter academically stalled her, caused her to lose her desire to learn, and more importantly, taught her to distrust the adult, adults who were supposed to be providing her with a free and appropriate education. She could no longer stay in that inappropriate environment and was homeschooled. Julia was placed at Lozano, where we have finally found the right fit. Lozano's approach has been to embrace her learning challenges, help her feel safe about the adults entrusted with teaching her, and allows her to become a part of an enriched learning environment. The committee reported that Lozano is underutilized, and that is an incorrect statement based on, our stand, on the standards used by the appointed commission. The report states that we are only utilizing 65% of our building. In reality, we are utilizing closer to 80%. Lozano has two autism classrooms with a maximum capacity of 13 students in each room per the district requirement. Since these rooms cannot be counted as typical home rooms, they end up adding students to our total, giving Lozano a capacity of 70%, a number that according to CPS's own standards removes our school from consideration for closure. Additionally, over 50% of Lozano students qualify for bilingual programs. Per federal state law, we must provide services and do so with half room designated for English as second language services. In accordance with the Chicago Teachers Union contract, space is provided for clinician meetings, resulting in the use of another half of a room. These combined spaces result in another classroom designation by law that is not a home room. Per federal state law, we must provide another room for world language, which again is not a home room. These additional two rooms add 60 more students to our enrollment, bringing our capacity to 80%. Yes. Accordingly, our capacity exceeds the requirement for closure, and this fact proves that Lozano must be removed from consideration. These facts and figures were presented to the committee at our community meeting and should be on record for the board's review. I am happy to resubmit the calculations to prove that Lozano does not qualify for closure. Finally, I would ask Dr. Bird Bennett and the board to look at a school like Lozano and see the tremendous impact it has had not only on my daughter, but on the entire student population. Our principal has been there for two short years, and in that time has secured a team of highly educated professionals. This has resulted in student growth as demonstrated by the results of the NWEA. Lozano students have shown tremendous turnaround under her leadership. She has created an environment of academic pride, high expectations for each student, and an air of emotional intelligence among the staff. Her leadership should be seen as a hallmark for the free and appropriate education that not only special needs students are entitled to, but the educational standards that all students should experience. Thank you. My son is Henry Morales Jr. and he's a fourth grader at Lozano Bilingual and International Center. At age three, he was diagnosed with autism and has been attending Lozano for the past four years in the special education program. Mrs. Pina has been his teacher ever since and has helped him progress from bouts of echolalia when words are repeated back to the teacher instead of responding to the question or instruction to complete sentences and full-on conversation. The teacher's aides have been outstanding as well, showing patience and care every step of the way, 
When he first had started attending Lozano, he was not interested in coloring and would scribble back and forth out of frustration. Now coloring is one of his favorite class activities. It is difficult for children with autism to adjust to new surroundings or new people. They often lack the basic social skills that we take for granted. How will our children with special needs deal with such a drastic transition? What effect will this have on the progress that they've made so far? Please don't ask our children with special needs to go through such a harrowing ordeal. Why should our children suffer due to our ineptitude to adequately solve a financial problem? Thank you. Um, next up is James Morgan from Trumbull. My name is James Morgan, M-O-R-G-A-N. Uh, I am uh, involved in Tr at Trumbull Elementary School. I'm on the Parent Advisory Council, which is part of the federally funded No Child Left Behind. And I have a question that I'd like to ask. How do I tell the parents that they're not being left behind? All right. They're being left behind. I'm here on behalf not only of my son, who's in fourth grade, uh, but the 144 other special education students that make up the, f the population of Trumbull Elementary, which, has, which is 37%. Uh, Trumbull offers a great program to our students, not only the general education, but also the special education. We have something called a vertical alignment, which means that the kids interact with each other up and down on grade levels. Not only with the general education, but with the special education as well. This is beneficial because it helps the children to integrate to each other. It helps them to learn from each other. Mm -hmm. My son has friends that are lower than him in grade, as well as upper in grade. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to remove him from the school and put him somewhere else, are you transforming him or are you transferring him? The utilization that's been uh, given to us and that we've all seen in the newspaper says that Trumbull's at 54%. That is not true. We're at 88% while meeting the guidelines of having special education students, either seven or 14 students per room. Could you imagine a classroom with 30 students, a population that's 37%, 30 students per room? What kind of education would any student get in that environment? Next, I'd like to talk about the definition of a routine. Everybody here has routines. There's a lot of routines going on upstairs, and we all have routines in our daily lives. Our students at Trumbull have routines as well. So for you to interrupt those routines, special education has been known, it's been documented through sources that when you remove a special ed or transfer a special ed student, you're setting them back by 18 months at least. So how will that help them in their routine? The next thing I'd like to talk about is trust. At Trumbull, we sent out 3,000 postcards to uh, Barbara Bird Bennis, to our aldermen, throughout our community. 3,000 postcards, parents, students, community members, all in Andersonville are rallying around Trumbull Elementary School. And I have one postcard that I'd like to share with everyone that came from a student. It says, don't close our school, or else I'm gonna call 911 on you. <laughs> Our students are feeling threatened by CPS. And this is unacceptable. Our students deserve the best. It's not the best when we fail a plan. It's not the best when we transition our students and when we, tra when we, when we traumatize them. Mm -hmm. We're traumatizing not only the students, we're traumatizing the parents, we're traumatizing the staff, we're traumatizing the community. Everyone loses with these decisions that are being made. We will not stand for this outrage anymore. We need to not only keep Trumbull open, but all of our schools need to be remained open to serve our students. much. Okay, next up is uh, Lafayette Thalia Castanone. Good morning, everyone. My name is Thalia Castanone. I am a sister of a student that attends Lafayette Elementary School, my brother Javier Villa Gomez. He is in a cluster program due to his disability. He has autism. He has been attending since the age of three once he was diagnosed technically from Head Start. Now he's currently in seventh grade. And honestly, with Lafayette, if it wasn't work for Lafayette School, he would actually, he's a success story. 
From being non-verbal and overly hyperactive, he is now a well-verbal child that does not stop talking. <laughs> and he is well-controlled. The teachers and staff at Lafayette has worked intensively with Javi through all the years, from Head Start to his present date to meet his de developmental milestones. Many of us that are present here today did have the pleasure in hearing his plea in front of the Fulton Network Community Meeting on February 26, 2013 at the First Baptist Congressional Church, where he stated, at school I have learned how to read, write, add, subtract, and talk a lot. So please do not close down my school. At the end of his plea, he had many in tears and he was given a standing ovation by 700 plus people that were attending. Lafayette Elementary School has provided an outstanding curriculum and dedication to all children with special needs, from autism, fragile X, Down syndrome, 504s, emotional disorders, and learning disabilities. At Lafayette, there is a population of 400 out of those 400 so if you an autism cluster program for these special needs children we offer five low incident classes to eighth grade with a maximum of 13 children per classroom and three cross-category self-contained classes also with the max of 13 children per class. So, Lafayette has a motto, a motto which is a passport to the future, which as well as parents, teachers, staff, students, and community members stand strong with. Our mission statement goes as follows. Lafayette will be a model school where each child will achieve self-actualization through the development of social, emotional, and academic skills in order to function as an informed citizen of our community. I do recall years ago when Chicago Public Schools letterhead quote was once, our children are future. Then later changed to no child left behind. Really? No child left behind? Mm -hmm. Think about it, with all these school closures, CPS is gonna leave thousands of kids behind. Yes. Technically throwing them all out at the wolves. Keep in mind that Lafayette is the second home from home for these students, a place that is safe for them. Thank you. Um, next, we're gonna hear from McClellan School. Hi, I'm a parent, mother of three CPS students. Today, I stand on behalf of my son, 11 years old, who has autism. He has already been through two school closings. He is presently a student at McCullen Elementary School, where he's thriving, he's stable, and he's doing an excellent job. I'm appalled to think that he can possibly be displaced again. I would like to ask CPS a few questions. Do you truly understand the repercussion and the major setback these actions will have on not only my son, but all of the other autistic students at McCullen. Do you realize this is a health issue, considering these special needs children with autism? They progress through repetition and stability. If you uproot them yet again, they will lose a lot of their gain. They will regress. We were told that McCullen was underutilized, which was proven since that there's, there was a miscalculation. Also, I would like to personally say percentages, numbers, figures, square footage is what our children are being compared to and measured by. Well, we as parents, uh, no, we don't view our autistic children as statistics or percentages. We see our children as beautiful kids who deserve an equal opportunity and a fair chance to have a quality education. Thank you. I have an autistic, autistic son. His name is Davion. I adopted him when he was two years old, and I moved to the city of Chicago so he can have a better education. I urge the mayor, Barbara Burr Bennett, to stop it. My son has consistently made 
progress while being at George B. McCullen School. He's talking, he's potty trained, he can write his name. To remove him from his source of trust would be detrimental. It's inhumane to move special need kids. Right. The parents need mental health. Yeah. I have had slept, yeah. I have been slapped because That's I don't right. know where my son will go next school year. Mm -hmm. My son functions by transitions mm -hmm. and routines and consistency. If you remove him from his school, he would just, he would deteriorate. It would take him a whole nother year to get used to the teachers, the friends, the routine. I urge you to come. Spend a day in my house with my son. I'm urging the mayor, any commissioners, any educators to come have dinner with me. See what I go through on a daily basis. I ask you to keep these schools open. One in 88 kids is diagnosed as autism. Chicago and the Chicago public schools need to support autism. It's no summer programs for these kids. I, I, I look around and see all these people with saddened faces. It hurts me that my son has nowhere to go next school year. Right. It hurts me that his routine would be crashed. It hurts me that the city of Chicago, as a taxpayer, that my child had to be shuffled around due to budget cuts. I just ask you to, to have compassion on kids with special needs. I ask you to look at your kids. When we look at kids that's, that has autism, the spectrum is from one to 100. Each kid functions differently. Mm -hmm. Each kid needs something different. So when you want to close a special needs school, mm -hmm. I don't think you see the repercussions. It's a safety issue. The kids are used to routines. They're used to their teachers. They're used to getting on the school bus. My kid no location. He say, Mom, make a right. Mm -hmm. He know his way to school. To take him to another school, to take him out of this element, would be detrimental. It's inhumane. It's unethical. I beg you to save our schools. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to have uh, Mary Moore from McNair next. We are from McNair Academy, 4820 West Walton. You know, I have a lot of paper in my hands, but I want to talk from my heart. I have a son that has IEP, they, that's what they said. But when my son first came to McNair, he was about three years old. He used to roll over in the floor, hide under the table, the desks. We had to look for him and everything. As he started growing up at McNair, he started changing, he started speaking. They said, they told me that my son would never talk and he would never walk and everything like that. Now, he's communicating with the people, he, the children. He's, he was isolating himself because he thought he wasn't good enough to be around other children. We have at our school now 417 students at our school. 106 are disabled kids. Well, a lot of people want to know, Mary, why you want to work with uh, special ed? That's my heart. The reason why Xavier came from rolling on the floor, hiding under desks, hiding in bathrooms. Now, this year, Xavier will be graduating with honor going to Wells. It's IEP. You know, McNair is a school of love. We have about eight yellow buses that bring special ed with uh, wheelchair assessments to our school. I volunteer a lot there. I am president of the LSC, but that doesn't matter about that. Uh, I see these kids, they're coming out. They, some of them, they'd be so happy running into our school. Coats are flying off, we're in school. They heard, I'm just like you, that our school was on the clothing list. They, some of them can't speak. I showed them a picture of our school made go. The little boy told me, he said, uh, my school no more. And I looked. I said, yes, we're going to do the best we can. She's going to speak next. Let me thank Mary for filling my heart full of joy. I'm a parent of four adopted kids. I don't know where DCFS is at, but they should be here helping us fight for our school. Yes. I, uh, the oldest one is 19 years old. We started off in public school at McNair when it was at the old place where the water was brown and the school was dirty and the walls were crumbling. 
We fought 17 years ago for McNair School. Now it's a beautiful place and they want to take it back. I think it's unfair. We have community children who walk to school every day. I mean, they're walking there and some of them are coming really yes, late. Yes. We're not responsible for that. We just open the door and receive the kids as they come. Mm -hmm. But they can't walk there. So they don't have to worry about their parents getting them there. They can walk. And I'm talking about the kids that don't have parents to stand up for them. Right. I'm standing for them today because I see these kids in my community. My community is the Austin community where not all the parents are up to parts, but once they make the school, they know they're going to get a meal. Mm -hmm. Okay, my school. My school has 417 students. Uh, two half-day preschool, two full-day kindergartens, and a special ed cluster. 97%, 97 97.6% <coughs> are low-income families. That means that I am standing here because I work in the community and I keep eight of those children yes. that I take to school every day. There are special need programs. 22.5% of the students receive special need services. Five low incident cluster programs. 72 students are served. 23 students are severe and profound. Do you know what that means? For them to be around children that can actually run and yes. jump yes. and talk, it makes them happy. They're joyful. They see other people besides people like them. Mm -hmm. And I think that's wonderful. Yes. Because before I can remember, when they had the Washington School, and they closed that school because they wanted the kids to be more in the community and more involved so they could get good jobs and they would know how to act yes. in the public. Yes. So now what we're going to do, are we going backwards? Mm -hmm. The other is a 23 cross-category special needs students. The building is handicap accessible. Yes. That means they don't have to go up the ramp, they don't have to go up the steps, they just slide in the school. The door is open and they come right in. They don't have to try to open the door. It's welcoming. It welcomes the children. I'm just going to put my paper down for a minute and talk about my own children because I fought this for 17 years ago for McNair. Mm -hmm. And so I'm back. I'm back to fight again. I'm fighting for my neighborhood children that I watch every day go to school. I'm fighting for the parents that are not coming out to fight for their own children. I'm standing here to say, let McNair stand. Why are you destroying something that does not need to be destroyed? You see the parents here begging for some type of consideration for their children and their conditions. What is the problem? There are a lot of other things that need to be done with the Chicago Board of Education. Look at your teacher's pensions. Look at your teacher's medical stuff. Help the teachers so they can help the children. Yes. I have teachers sliding in our school right now. Could be at home because they're sick, mm -hmm. but they're sliding into school because of their pension mm -hmm. funds or because of their medical funds are not adequate. Come on now. Find something to do. Don't close our schools. Don't, don't shut our kids out. Find something else to do. Thank you. I'm standing here representing the parents of Ryder. Uh, as, you, as you look at the numbers for school closing, in the Inglewood Gresham area, the largest concentrations of schools are in our area. That being said, Ryder is only one of two in the Inglewood Gresham area that are, that are optimized to receive uh, special needs children. So if Ryder was to close, then where would the children in the Inglewood Gresham area go? Would you bus them way across town? Would you bus them to the north side? Or exactly what would you do with those kids? Uh, as teachers, if you close schools with teachers that are, that are on board, that are capable of teaching your children, then the, the optimized is you will put them in the teacher pool. Well, if you got a senior teacher that's near retirement and they, I've had a lot of teachers come to me and say, I am tired. You know, I, I don't feel like going on. I don't feel like fighting this anymore. You're teaching, taking that one teacher out that's optimized to teach your child to the best ability. So I'm asking CPS, especially the state, to come together and find a solution where we can all maintain our kids within our community, where they're best slated to be taught, where they're best slated to find safety and security. 
Would you want your child to be bused from one part of the town not knowing when, where, how, or what was going on with them at that certain time of day? Because that's the most perilous time of the day, moving back and forth from and to school. So I'm asking Baba Bird Bennett and Mary Manuel to take a look at this problem yes. and come up with a reasonable solution, mainly keeping our schools open. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. I'm here to represent my child. He's a uh, special need child at Iberico Fermi Elementary School. And since he came to the school, he's, they have done a wonderful job on him. The teachers are very cooperative. They in cooper in, they talking to me all the time about his progress, his good and bad. And you know, I was just looking at life, looking at the news, how this, we losing our children every day to the streets. So if they can't go to school, where would they go? We need these schools to stay open. And it, if you know what a special need child challenges are, you understand what I'm talking about when I tell you that he's comfortable where he are. Enrico Fermi, they have, he's made a lot of progress there. It was at one point in time I heard the other uh, parents say that he, their children was rolling on the floor, my child was jumping off the ceiling. He was really all over the place, but they have really contained him and got him where he could actually function. So I'm begging you all, CPS, please don't close this school. Ibrico Fermi. It's a great school. I see a lot of progress and there's lots of other children with special needs there also who's being helped at the moment, you know. So we are begging you all not to close these schools. This seems like a form of bullying or something, you know, and we talk against that. Thank you. Okay. The last speaker is from uh, Stockton School, Libera Lee. Stockton is one of the schools on uh, the Chicago Board of Education. Chicago Public uh, list to be closed and combined with another school for the 2013 to 14 school year. Stockton School just had over $12 million of renovation done, which made the school handicap accessible. Not only did we get a ramp, but also an elevator. Our school has many special need children. The teachers and support staff are dedicated and very caring to our students. The depth of caring has been shown by our speech pathologist, Marilyn Sander, who raised <coughs> over $161,000 to have a snoozing room put in the school. The snoozing room is a multi-sensory environment that helps promote STEM communication and increase attention spans for students with special needs. This room is vital to the learning of the children. We, the parents and the school community of Stockton School are against any school closing. What, what will happen to our special needs children when you combine school? The answer to that question is that the class sizes will become larger and the children will not get the special one-on-one -on -one attention that they need. If the Board of Education does this, you will only be warehousing special needs children. They are entitled to the best education we can give them. I repeat, we are against any school closing due to the effect it will have on all our communities and most importantly, our special needs students. Thank you. Commented on whether they would be happy with their kids being more integrated in a, another nearby neighborhood school, you know, so the cluster programs, you know, maybe there's something better coming. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> no. 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 It's, the, it's the routine. Um, Can you step up to the mic? Yes. Autism thrives off of, um, autism children thrive off of repetition repeatedly so it's the routine of getting acclimated to a whole nother setting that they're not familiar with it doesn't matter whether there's a better cluster program it's that the whole restructure of these children would have to see a new facility new people new places and it's it's so chaotic as a parent to you the, the children more than likely are nonverbal you can't get a reply from them how's your new school how's your new transformation or what you can't get that from them, so you have to basically go on their physical being. And I, I've, I can tell you, just if you stop a child's routine on a daily basis with autism, he, he's all over the place. So a new facility is not the answer. If they're doing well and progressing where they're at, 
we're looking at people. We're not looking at footage and percentages and space and, and under utilization. We're looking at human beings that we're trying to get healthy, holistically. What two schools have your have been closed? You said your child was. I've been. I've come from Attics, Christmas Attics, from Christmas Attics to Abbott, from Abbott to now McCullen, and in between I was at Drake for a short, a short period with him, but there was there was some form of bullying going on. So actually, this if I put it together, it'll be actually three um, different transformations, and it's that's that's not a normal thing for anyone. I didn't grow up in the school. I went to school from K through eighth and from twelfth, from ninth through twelfth. It's not normal to go from school to school to school. And I think one thing other parents who couldn't make it today have said it's not just the teacher, it's the principal, the security guard, the lunch yes. ladies. Everybody yes. knows these kids in the building. I think CPS has the mindset you can just you know, they're transferring cattle and putting them in a new, new building. So it's not, even even if the classroom teacher is moved, it's, you know, many principals don't have the familiarity with special needs that, that many of these programs have. So it's all the adults in the building. And, and what, I would say, what, when they, when they get transferred, what services will they have there? There's been no plan, there's been nothing announced to us. So that's fine. If you're gonna if you're gonna take the students from one school and all their services and put them in another school, why don't you just leave them where they're at? Right. That's the that would savings. make sense. What? Where's the savings when you have to transfer kids, all the all the equipment that they have, all their stuff? You might as well just leave it where it is. Right. I'd like to speak about an experience that I had. As I said before, I adopted four special need children some time back, uh, 19, 18, 16, and the youngest one is 15. I did transfer them for a while to a charter school to only have them to have to write a program for them. When they came into the school, it was nothing there in place for special needs students. So I'm saying this here because with everything that's going on, I don't want parents to jump up and run and transfer their kids to schools that does not have the accommodations. I also transferred my kids to private school, Catholic school did not have the necessary accommodations. To tell me in my son's last year, fourth year of high school, we cannot meet his needs. Well, if they couldn't meet him in the fourth year, they certainly couldn't meet him in the first year. So I'm just saying, beware. Don't run and transfer your yes, kids right. to these schools unless you investigate and make sure they have the necessary programs or you'll be like that lady, transferring from school to school, and it's not right.